Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Tuesday morning, November 22nd, 2022. Hope everybody's doing well today. We are in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 18 this morning. We are, of course, cross-posted onto the nearchurches.com Facebook page. And if you're watching and you have any questions or comments on either the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring page or the nearchurches.com Facebook page, Use your comment section, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. Lyle, Diana, Wayne, Brian, Janie, Gail, good to see all of you guys. We also have a viewer from, hey, Miss Marisa, good to see you, from Uganda, Africa. And I'm not going to try to pronounce your name because I know I would mess it up, but good to have you from Uganda this morning. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3, we have been... Hey, Miss Sharon, good morning. Good to see you. Anna, good to see you. Folks, keep joining on. That's a good thing, though. First Peter chapter 3, Peter has just been addressing the issue of suffering. You know, if you suffer because you deserve it, or if you're suffering because you deserve it, you know, you've done something you shouldn't do, well, okay, that's not good. But if you're suffering for the cause of Christ, well, that's a good thing. Uh, 1 Peter 3.17, For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And then he begins talking about Christ, and that's going to continue on into chapter 4. So we're ready again, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins. We talked about this a bit yesterday. This word once appears several times in the New Testament, uh, several times in reference to the death of Jesus. Uh, Hebrews 7.27 Hebrews 9.28, you know, those Old Testament sacrifices, they were offered, Hebrews 10, what is it, Hebrews 10.3, I think it is, they were offered year by year continually. The the, The sacrifice of Jesus was once and for all. This word also, this word once also is used in Jude 3 to talk about the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Well, the gospel is what that's talking about. So this word once has a prominent place in the New Testament Christ also suffered once for sins. We talked about that yesterday a bit. The just, the one who was just or righteous. Some versions use the word righteous here for the ones who were not righteous. That he might bring us to God. And this is where we kind of ended yesterday. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. A couple different views here. Some people believe that Jesus being made alive in spirit, by whom also... We'll, we'll discuss verses 19 and 20, but I take the view here in 1 Peter 3.18 that he was made alive by the Spirit is in terms of the resurrection. We looked yesterday at Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 uh, that he was raised from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness. Hey, good morning, Billy, over on the Near Churches page. I think this is in connection with the Holy Spirit. That makes sense in that thought of the resurrection, but it also makes sense with what he's what Peter's getting ready to say. Hey, good morning, Miss Jean. Good to see you. So he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. I don't think that's a reference to Jesus' personal spirit. I mean, think about that. If, If Jesus were made alive spiritually, that means he had to die spiritually. And we discussed that yesterday. Jesus was put to death in the flesh. He died physically. He did not die spiritually. Um, he didn't become a sinner. He died for sin. He, he suffered the penalty of death. Um, the wages of sin is death. He took that upon himself in our place. And in connection with his resurrection, he was made alive by the Spirit. Again, Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. But then notice the continu- continuation here in verse 19 and what Peter's talking about. Okay, made alive by the Spirit, by whom also... He went and preached to the spirits in prison. So again, this this particular passage has caused a lot of interesting discussion. What did Jesus do when he died? Where did he go? Well, I guess let me answer that in a in a quick way. And I'm going to go to Luke. I think I'm right here. I think it's Luke 23 and verse 43. Yeah. Jesus is hanging on the cross. One of the thieves is mocking him, or one of the criminals is mocking him. 
Luke 23, 40, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? In other words, we're all up here dying, and you're making fun of him? He says, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. All right, we're criminals. We belong here. This is what our life has led to. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Some people try to change the punctuation, and they say, Well, what Jesus was really saying was, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. In other words, I'm saying to you right now in this moment, today. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Where was Jesus going when he died? Well, he understood he was going to paradise, a place of comfort. So that connects. Let me go back here now to 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, where we are studying. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So there are some people who teach that Jesus, when he died, went to the Hadean realm to torment, as we read about in Luke chapter 16, and he preached to, preached to those lost souls to give them an opportunity to get out of torment. There's a problem with that. There's a major textual problem with that. Well, first of all, this idea of second chances after death, that's, that's a biblical subject that we could address. But notice what happens here in Luke chapter 16 as this rich man is suffering in torment, and Lazarus is comforted, okay? Abraham says to him, to the rich man, Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you, notice this, cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Well, Okay, when you die, one of the things the, biblical, the Bible teaches us is that when you die, you know where you're going to go. That's one of the points here of Luke 16, 19 through 31. You know your eternal destination when you die. It doesn't only teach that. It also teaches that when you die and get there, wherever that may be in the Hadean realm, you can't go to the other side. Now, for those who believe that Jesus, when he died, went to torment and preached to those people, did, did this law, did this great gulf that is fixed somehow, was that suspended for a couple of days while Jesus was there? Is there anything in the biblical text that would teach you that? Well, no, there's not. So, hey, good morning, Miss Norma. So, let's get back to First Peter. So, the point being here, when you die, you know where you're going. There's a great gulf fixed, and you cannot leave the place where you are, okay? That's the, uh, as we might say, that's the end of the road once you die. So what does it mean that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison, as some people say? Well, if you read the text carefully, it doesn't say that Jesus went and preached to the souls in Hades. Notice what it says here. Jesus was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit... The Holy Spirit, notice this, by whom also he went. Okay, so whatever preaching he's talking about here was accomplished by the Spirit who is involved in the resurrection, the Holy Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the souls in prison. Well, what does that mean, these souls that were in prison? Well, that's the word means confined or imprisoned. They weren't literally in a guardhouse somewhere uh, or behind bars. Who was he talking about here? And to whom, remember, this is by the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, by whom also he went and preached to those souls. Well, who are these people who formerly were disobedient? Okay, disobedient people. But notice two words here. When and while. These are time words, all right? By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. 
when did this preaching take place that was done by the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead? By whom? When did this preaching take place? When God's long suffering was waiting while the ark was being prepared. See, so many people have preconceived notions or things they've been taught, like when Jesus died, he went to to torment and preached and, and tried to get people out of there. No, he didn't. There's a great gulf fixed, and those who are there cannot pass from there to here, and those who are here cannot pass from here to there. That, that, that wasn't suspended while Jesus was in the grave. And Jesus himself said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. Jesus knew where he was going. Jesus didn't go to hell. Um, he didn't go to preach to people who were lost and try to get them saved after they died. You can't do that, according to the biblical text. And so these two words here in uh, 1 Peter 3.20 are so important to understand what is this preaching to these spirits who were imprisoned? What is it talking about? Well, it was done when and while. And specifically, the preaching was done while the ark was being prepared. So then the question becomes, is there any textual indication any biblical text indication that tells us what preaching was going on? Well, yes, actually there is. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Now notice Second Peter 2, 5. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people. Notice this a preacher of righteousness. Second Peter 2 5 matches up perfectly with First Peter 2 verses 19 and 20. The preaching was done by Noah himself, but it was made possible through the Spirit who raised Jesus up from the dead. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. And that's been God's method of communication to man forever. Man to man, preaching the word. Um so this, this Noah was a preacher of righteousness, okay? So when I'm looking here then at 1 Peter chapter 3, and we read about this preaching to the spirits in prison in verse 19, these were individuals, spirits, who were imprisoned in sin and in, you might say, in rebellion to God. But the preaching was done by the Spirit, by whom? It's clear that this is talking about how it was accomplished. Second Peter 2.5 tells me that the preacher was Noah. All right? And it tells me when this preaching took place. Okay, when God's long-suffering waited. Notice this phrase. In the days of Noah. And then this phrase. While the ark was being prepared. Nothing mysterious here. Now, are, there are mysterious denominational doctrines and errors that are taught uh, saying that Jesus, when he died, went to hell and preached to the lost. And yet the text right here in 1 Peter 3.20 answers that. The preaching was done when something was taking place and while something was taking place. Okay? While the ark was being prepared, in which few, that is, eight souls were saved Okay, here we go. This is so controversial with so many people. Baptism. But notice the phrase here. Talking about the ark, in which few, that is eight souls, were saved. Whoa, what does it say here? Through water. They were saved through water. Okay? The water destroyed some and the water saved others. How did, it, how did water save? Well, God instructed them to build an ark. You go back to Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to send rain upon the earth. I'm going to send a flood upon the earth. And everything whose breath is within itself, everything's going to die. You get inside the ark. And when it rains, you read the text, again, Genesis 6 and 7. They went into the ark. The Lord shut the door behind them. And the waters lifted up the ark above all the destruction. Peter says, Eight souls were saved 
through water. Can't miss that because of the next verse. There is also an antitype which now, notice these three words, now saves us. There are so many folks who would like for this verse to say, instead of now, they would like that W on the end of now to be a T. So let's read it that way. There is also an antitype which not saves us, which does not save us. Baptism. Because so many people say that baptism is not necessary. Water baptism is not necessary for salvation. Water baptism is a sign that you're already saved. And yet Peter, okay, now think about it, think about it this way. Make this connection. Peter is the guy who we have recorded as preaching on Pentecost, or rather, all the apostles preached on Pentecost. But when the, when the Jewish audience cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? It was Peter whose answer was recorded. Repent and let every one of you be baptized for the remission of sins. Peter seems pretty consistent here. There were eight souls saved through water. And there's an antitype which now saves us. Well, what is that antitype? Peter says it's baptism. So let's do this real quick. Okay, what is an antitype? What does that even mean? Well, it, it's the idea of a symbol being fulfilled. All right, let me show this to you in the biblical text. What are, what are types and antitypes? A type, the Greek word is tupos. T-U-P-O-S, we'd spell it like that. And it talks about, it's a reference to something that is perhaps in a present time that is pointing to something greater in the future. And Colossians 2 lays this out pretty clearly. Colossians 2.16 says, Let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding of festivals or new moons or Sabbaths, notice, which are a shadow of things to come. Okay. That's what we're talking about. Those things under the old law, they were a shadow. They foreshadowed. You know, you think about walking on a bright and sunny day. You look down on the ground and you see your shadow. That's your, uh, that's not really you. That's not your substance. That's your shadow. Well, the old law was not the substance, all right? It was a shadow, Colossians 2.17, of things to come. But the substance, the reality, okay, the fulfillment is Christ. So when we are here in 1 Peter chapter, let me get back to it real quick. When we're here in 1 Peter chapter 3, and Peter says in verse 21, there is an antitype, an antitype, which now saves us. That means that this water that saved Noah and his family was the type. It was the shadow. It was something that was before, but it was pointing to something greater in the future. Okay, so for instance, Moses is referred to as a type of Christ. Um, Melchizedek was a type of Christ. We have these references throughout the Old Testament. Um, A lot of people make the connection, you know, the ark is a type of the church. In order to be saved from the flood, you had to be in the ark. Well, in order to be saved... From sin, you have to be in Christ, in the church. You have these comparisons. Well, the flood, people were, eight souls were saved through the waters of the flood. They got in the ark, and the waters lifted them up above the destruction. And they survived. The fulfillment of that, the antitype, which now saves us, is baptism. And yet, how many people do we all know that says, that they say, baptism does not save you? Peter says, those souls were saved by water, and we're saved by baptism. Baptism is not a sign that you've already been saved. That doesn't, the scripture does not say that ever. It's kind of, it's kind of like, um, you know, the sinner's prayer. So many people believe that you accept Jesus into your heart and you say this little prayer and then you're saved. Scripture never, there is no indication anywhere that that is what saves. Prayer does not save you. All right? Baptism, so in the same way, baptism is never said to be a symbol or a sign that you're already saved. In in denominational parlance, people often say, 
Baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. Okay, it's, 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 in other words, it signifies physically what's already happened spiritually. And that is simply untrue. Those eight souls were saved through water. And people now, Peter says, are saved in baptism. Well, obviously, that's a reference to water baptism. So this baptism has to correspond with the salvation that occurred through water. And it can only be one thing. It's not spiritual baptism. Noah and his family were not saved in spiritual water. They were saved through water, physical, and that physical water. And that's exactly what Peter's talking about here. Now, I want to read you something. Gene says, sort of like a blueprint for a house that you are go- going to get built. Yes. Um, Diana, I can see how people would say that, like, anti- Christ is against Christ, and then anti-type would mean not a type or against the type because of the comparison of the two. It does make sense, um, but it's a fulfillment. That's what this anti-type is. Water saved them, and the anti-type now that is the fullness of that is what saves us. David says, I know people, let me, I know people who will take Romans 10, 9, and 10 and say that it's the sinner's prayer. Yeah, um, the interesting thing is Peter, uh, Peter, Paul there in Romans 10, 9, and 10 is talking to Christians and specifically to Jewish Christians and how they need to be sure that they're making the right confession. It has nothing to do with, as, as you know, David, denying the necessity of baptism. And people will say that, well, baptism's not mentioned once in Romans chapter 10. You know what? That may be true, but have you ever read Romans chapter 6? So... It's so interesting because people will do so much, that they'll have so many linguistic gymnastics to get around the necessity of baptism that they just completely contradict the biblical text. And it's not because the Bible denies the necessity of baptism. It's because a person's theology does. That's what it comes down to, really. Uh, All right, I want to read something to you. So I was looking up a couple of words by definition. And this is a Bible dictionary that I have, and uh, it's, it's actually a dictionary on this word antitype in 1 Peter chapter 3, and it says, um, a model, a figure, a form, or an impression. That's what this word means, okay? Um, it's, it's a resemblance. It corresponds. And in fact, some English versions actually say um, something along the lines of 1 Peter 3.21, um, there is now baptism which corresponds to this there's something that corresponds to this baptism which now saves us well that's what he's talking about but listen to what this author says then in connection to you know is baptism necessary or not he says the water in the case of the flood symbolizes not salvation okay so he he this guy says that the water didn't save them okay the, the, the water of the flood symbolizes not salvation, but the means of destruction used by God. <laughs> but notice what the Bible says. That's what a dictionary says, but notice what the Bible says. Eight souls were saved through water. This guy takes the position that, well, the water was for destruction, not salvation. I mean, that's what he says. And yet the Bible says... It was the water that saved them. So, see, that's what people do. That's what I mean by linguist, linguistic gymnastics. All the water doesn't save. It destroyed people. Well, yes, it destroyed people. There's no, Nobody argues that. Well, they shouldn't argue against that. But it also saved people. So, there you go. What, whose word are you going to take? A Bible dictionary or the Bible? Okay, so let's just end that discussion right here with this question. Does the Bible say that baptism now saves you or not? Well, you have to answer yes. And it corresponds with the water that saved those eight souls. There's no, there is no way to get around that, logically, scripturally. But notice what Peter does here. It's not the removal of of the filth of the flesh. Okay, so baptism. You're not getting in a baptistry or a stream or a pond or whatever to get dirt off of your body. That's what he's talking about here. 
baptism is something that you must do physically. You must be immersed in water for the remission of sins. But the purpose of being immersed in water is not to get dirt off of your external self. All right? You don't take a wash rag and a bar of soap with you. This is a spiritual cleansing. It cleanses from sin. It's not, so that's what he's saying here. It's not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, here's the interesting thing right here in 1 Peter chapter 3, because the word conscience appears earlier, and it's in reference to one's conduct and the fact that one should sanctify the Lord God in their hearts, be ready always to give a defense, having a good conscience. Okay? So you're conducting yourself properly. You're able to give a verbal defense of your faith. Now, in connection with baptism, you're not putting off dirt on your physical body. You have a good conscience toward God. Because you've been baptized, because eight souls were saved by water, and what corresponds to that saves us, and that's baptism. And by the way, you know, so some people say that baptism... The baptism required is a spiritual baptism. This deals with that right here. It's not the, this baptism in water is not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not a spiritual baptism. This is baptism in water for the remission of sins. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God. I am doing what God told me to do in baptism. Noah and his family were saved because they did what God said to do. They prepared the ark, they got in the ark, and they were saved through water. Well, if I want to be saved, I need to be baptized, not for a physical bath, but so that I can have a, a good conscience toward God. I'm doing what God has told me to do. And I want you to notice here at the end of verse 21, and I see comments are coming up, so I'll, I'll get with them here in just a second. But notice what's connected here in verse 21 with baptism and the good conscience. Where does this power come from? Okay, you know, th there is this idea that churches of Christ teach what's called um, baptismal regeneration. Okay, that the, essentially that the power's in the water to regenerate, to give you a new life. And that's, I don't, I've never taught that, and I don't know anybody who does teach that personally. That's one of those straw man arguments, you know, it's, it's an argument that, that opponents to baptism will make up so that they can tear it down easily. The power is not in me. The power is not in the water. It is through, notice what Peter says here, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is very similar to Colossians 2. Let me, let me flip over there real quick. Colossians 2 and verse... 12 in reference to baptism buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him notice this phrase right here through faith in the working of God see one of the things that we are told that churches of Christ are told is well you take you teach a works based salvation because you tell people they need to be baptized and if they need to be baptized that means they're having to do work in order to be saved notice what the Bible says about baptism. You're raised with him, which implies a burial. That's what baptism is. It's a burial. You are buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, notice this, through faith in the working of God. Notice it does not say here, through faith in your own works, through faith in your Church of Christ works-based salvation system. It doesn't say anything close to that. In baptism, I am submitting myself to a command of God. I'm not trusting in myself to be saved. The Great Commission was, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. See, Mark 16, 16 is a promise. It's not a command. You do this and this, and you will be saved. When I am baptized and raised with him... My faith is in the operation of God, who also raised Jesus from the dead. So, I go back to 1 Peter chapter 3, and even though people disagree with it, the Bible still says it, baptism saves you, and the power of baptism is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The end of 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. 
It's not in my works. It's not in me trusting in myself. It's me doing what God said to do. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. See, Jesus is reigning right now. We just did that study a while back on premillennialism. A lot of folks are still waiting for Jesus to come back and reign. He's reigning right now. All things have been subjected to him. He's reigning in his kingdom right now. All right, let me look at these comments here real quick. Um, because God, Diana says, because God could have gone through with destroying all men, but found good in Noah and his family, became compassionate. Well, yeah, and, and you go back to Genesis chapter 6 uh, and verse 8, and Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Well, how did he find favor? I think Genesis 6, 22 helps us understand that. In connection with God telling him to build the ark, it says that Noah did all things that God commanded him. That shows a pattern in Noah's life. God, uh, Noah found favor in God's sight because Noah did what God said do. Um, he was sorry, he, in terms of God, sorry he made man, wanted to get rid of man, but had compassion on Noah. So, therefore, salvation of man through Noah... Salvation of man through Noah then, yeah. Well, in a sense, yes, all mankind was saved because Noah was preserved. And after he got off the ark, the, let's say the race continued. But um, right here in 1 Peter chapter 3, I mean, it's... <laughs> you know, one thing I hear all the time in terms of baptism, well, that's a Church of Christ teaching. Well, then I guess Peter was a member of the Church of Christ. Because we teach today what he was saying 2,000 years ago. Baptism does save. And it's, it's because I can have, in doing what God requires of me, I have the answer of a good conscience toward him. And that's what I want. But the power is not in me. It's, again, 1 Peter 3.21, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And Jesus is now in heaven raining. All right, guys. That's First Peter 3. So we'll come back tomorrow, Lord willing, and we will get into First Peter chapter 4, where he continues talking about suffering and the Christian's, uh, the Christian's mindset toward suffering and toward life in general in connection with living faithfully, as Jesus did. All right. Well, appreciate y'all being on here today. And hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11. We'll get in 1 Peter chapter 4, so have a good day. And, uh, well, that's it. We'll see you.